Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Fruit and Vegetable Magazine's uh, Brown Marmorated Stink Bug webinar. My name is Margaret Land, editor of Fruit and Vegetable Magazine. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is brought to you by BASF and I'd like to thank the company for supporting this event and the industry. BASF is a leader in horticulture crop protection and actively works to bring solutions to help its customers address challenges in their operations. Before we get started, I'd just like to take this time to run over a few housekeeping issues. There will be an opportunity at the end of the webinar to ask our speakers questions about their presentations. You can write your queries or comments in the question tab at any time during the presentation, and we'll make sure they're answered after both speakers have finished. As well, all webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email tomorrow, that'll be Friday, that will contain a link to a recording of today's presentation. For you social media gurus out there, feel free to tweet or post during the webinar using hashtag BMSB. We'll be hearing from two speakers today. The first is Hannah Fraser, the entomologist for horticulture with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. She's a graduate of the University of Guelph and has been the provincial hort entomologist since 2000. Canada is responsible for monitoring provincial insect pest issues, and her most recent efforts include the development of monitoring networks and outreach for spotted winged Drosophila and brown marmorated stink bug. She is also the chair of the National Technical Working Group for brown marmorated stink bug and developed to address research, extension, and regulatory needs for the agricultural sector. Thank you, Hannah, for joining us today. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm going to start this out with a problem because my screen is frozen on my end, so perhaps we could check that. Okay, great. Minor technical glitch. Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm not sure who's participating today, but I'm, I'm hoping that we have some time for discussion at the end. Maybe some of you that are on the call have actually direct experience in working with brand marmorated stink bug and would like to share with this group. So really, um, in telling the story of, of brand marmorated stink bug, what I'm going to be trying to do today is integrate some of the research that has gone on with this invasive bug over the last 10 years or so, focusing mainly on the US and Canada. So this talk includes really a sampling of all of the efforts that researchers have been making rather than a comprehensive overview. It's really beyond the scope of this webinar. But what I'd like to try to cover today is to talk about the invasion history of brown marmorated stink bug, talk about how to identify it. It's really, really important. There are lots of other stink bugs out there that can be confused with brown marmorated. And so if you're, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's good to get to know it. I'm going to talk about the situation in Ontario and a little bit in, the can in, in Canada. And we'll cover some of the key research findings, in particular those that are helpful from uh, a management standpoint. And then I'm going to show you at the end where you can go for more information. So brown marmorated stink bug, it's uh, uh, yet another introduced pest. Um, we, you know, I'm used to dealing um, with quite a number of them over the last few years. Um, the Haliomorpha halis is the scientific name of this insect and it is a stink bug. The common name is brown marmorated stink bug. And it's, it's a, it really describes its marbled appearance. That, what, that is what marmorated means. As the name suggests, stink bugs do emit a pungent odor from glands that are located when they're, uh, when they're disturbed. And I have learned that if you handle lots of them, um, you're going to find your hands become stained and you're going to carry a stench with you for hours and your spouse is not going to want to be anywhere near you. Um, this insect is, uh, is native to Asia, where it's a common pest of many agricultural crops. So it's part of a complex of stink bugs. It is a pest in its native range but it's not, uh, it, it isn't a pest the same way that it is uh, here in North America and in, and in Europe. Um, this is a, an introduced pest. So it, it arrived probably in the mid-1990s. We're not exactly sure. Um, the, there are interceptions from imported goods that date back to that period. And this bug is a really, really great hitchhiker. It gets moved around in car, cars, in luggage. And due to the tendency to aggregate at certain times of the year, it often arrives in numbers that are suitable for establishment. So the first specimens that were co collected in North America were in Allentown, Pennsylvania, but it wasn't actually positively identified until 2001. 
for the next couple of years, it spread to some other mid-Atlantic states. And it wasn't until 2008 when people started to really see fruit injury occurring fairly late in the season. Two years later, by 2010, growers were experiencing severe fruit injury in the mid-Atlantic. And by 2011, and since then, they've been using a fairly aggressive chemical control program to try to manage it. This pest really captured the attention of homeowners and businesses before it really hit the agricultural scene. BMSB does overwinter outside in the landscape under the bark of dead and dying trees, but it also tends to move indoors in the fall. So there are peak migration periods involving hundreds or thousands of individuals trying to get inside at once, and that can be pretty overwhelming. We often get lots of calls in Ontario from the public during warm days in the fall, in late September, and in early, uh, early October when this bug is moving inside. Stink bugs have piercing sucking mouth parts and the injury they cause is a direct result of this. They also inject a toxic saliva into plant tissues and this can cause uh, further uh, tissue damage. Other stink bugs also cause these injuries and it really isn't possible to tell them apart. But what can differ is the timing of the injury in the crop and also in many crops only the adults of native species are feeding but with the MSB the injury can be caused by both the adult, the nymphs or both. Some of the more typical um, damage symptoms that you'll see is gummosis in fruit, so kind of oozing out of fruit, deformations, you'll see internal necrosis. If you look under the skin, you'll see a spotty, a spongy, corky tissue underneath. It can be sunken or collapsed or discolored. You can get uh, early fruit drops, shriveled berries, and a sort of um, uneven maturing of your crop. Brown memory distinct bug caused $37 million in crop damages to the mid-Atlantic apples in 2010. It was really, um, a, it's, a, it's a pretty big economic uh, injury. These pictures show that typical external injury and that corky tissue that can be found under the skin of the fruit. You can see that uh, on those pictures on the right. On the pictures on the left, that's actually fairly recent damage, so probably only a couple of days old. The stuff on the right has probably been injured for several weeks, so the stink bug is long, long gone by that point. A wide variety of other crops are affected by brown marmorated stink bug. It can actually feed right through the husk of corn. You can see all those little nymphs and, uh, and an adult feeding through right through the husk of that corn, and that's the kind of damage that you would see um, underneath if you actually peeled it back. So peaches are a preferred host. You'll hear that a few times in this talk. And despite pretty aggressive management, growers experienced really significant injury in that 2010 year with more than 50% crop loss. So that's, um, that is a, it's a lot of money on the ground. Brown marmorated stink bug is a really highly prolific uh, landscape level pest. It feeds on many, many different things. And this can mean that it can build up in some of these unmanaged areas outside of the crop. The adults and the nymphs are actually tracking food resources through the growing season. The chart that is up here was put together by the US Brown Marmorated Stink Bug IPM Working Group. And they've actually found, um, that, uh, this is of the different crops at risk. They've actually found in looking at brown marmorated stink bug on, on host in the landscape that it has over 150 or 100, 170 different hosts. Some of the plants are not necessarily crops, but they may be really important to the regional success of brown marmorated stink bug. So things like Tree of Heaven or Catalpa, Redbud, Mulberry, Holly, Buckthorn, those are things outside of the cropping system that brown marmorated stink bug can feed on when it's not actually in, in the crop. So this is the actual beast. Brown marmorated stink bug um, looks very similar to other stink bugs unless you start to look for some specific features. It's a fairly large stink bug. Um, the females are about 16 millimeters in length. The, ma the males tend to be a little bit smaller. The feature that I tell people to look for um, when, they're, when they're examining their specimens is to see if there are two white bands on each antenna. That is a really, really important distinguishing feature for brown marmorated stink bug, and it's really visible in a specimen that's uh, still alive or perhaps is recently dead. Those antenna do break off pretty, pretty easily once they're, once they're dead. Some of the other features that are important are the white, there's a white band on each of the legs of the adult. It's fainter in the adult than in the nymph. And if you look at the area behind the head, the pronotum or the shoulders, they're actually quite smooth. For a lot of other brown stink bugs, you'll find little spikes that are there, little spines that are there, and those are absent in the brown marmorated stink bug. 
some of the other features that people like to point out are the uh, white and black alternating bands um, along the side of the abdomen, the edge of the abdomen. But there are other stink bugs that have those features, so I don't find they're, they're really that useful a feature. Look for those white bands on each antenna. And this is the underside of the brown marmorated stink bug, and I really just wanted to show that uh, the mouse parts that are there, that arrow shows how long they actually are. So that is what the stink bug is actually putting into the, the plant and causing that injury. Brown marmorated stink bug overwinter in structures and in the natural landscape, and those adults are starting to move out usually mid-April until about the end of June. The adults disperse and they feed for a couple of weeks before mating. The female will lay several egg masses over the course of her lifetime, usually in batches of 25 to 28. And since they emerge from their overwintering sites over quite a long period of time, there are often overlapping life stages present in the field. In this picture, you can actually see the little eyes of the developing nymphs, those little red spots, and you can see the black egg breaker that the nymphs will use to, to push their way out. Before leaving her babies to fend for themselves, the female smears a symbiotic gut bacteria on those eggs. These are really important for the development and survival of nymphs. All of the nymphs will emerge from their eggs at the same time, and they aggregate on the egg mass, where they feed for several days on the egg chorion and the gut bacteria. Those gut symbionts are really important, so important that if you sterilize the eggs before they hatch, the survival to adulthood is greatly diminished, even into the subsequent generation. It's possible someday we'll be able to take advantage of the gut symbiont, symbiont relationship to help manage the MSB. These are second instar nymphs, although you can see a couple of first instars that haven't molted, these little red guys that are up here. The second instars will eventually move away from the egg mass, and although you can still find them in small aggregations, many people say these look a lot like ticks. Um, I've looked at a lot of brown marmorated stink bugs, and, and I don't see that, but at any rate, that is, uh, that is the second instars. And as they, they, they start to grow, their abdomens will become uh, sort of more reddish brown again. As the nymphs continue to grow, they start to take on some of the characteristics of the adult, but not all of them. You can see those white bands developing on the antenna. And the white bands, one on each leg, is really, really obvious at this point. Stink bugs have five nymphal instars. Development from egg to mature adult is a function of temperature and end of, end of nutrition. A degree day model has been developed, but we're not sure how well it really works in Ontario. Preliminary data shows we can expect a single generation in southern Ontario every year. The picture on the bottom right there is actually of a newly molted adult, and it's really white when they first come out, and then they darken as they age. There's lots of other stink bugs in Ontario and probably in most regions for the participants today. Several of them are actually important predators of agricultural crops, so it's really important to learn to distinguish those friends from foes. There's a paper that was put out by a group of researchers um, at the University of Guelph led by Steve Paro, and it's a great photographic key um, to those we find locally here in Ontario. Um, I find BMSC really easy to identify, but when you're just starting out, it's, it's easy to confuse them with similar looking species. So, it's best to confirm them with your local experts if you're in doubt. Interceptions of BMSB in vehicles or in cargo are really good indications the pest is being moved into regions. However, homeowner fines are also an important early warning that this, the pest can be locally established. In Ontario, those homeowner reports have contributed significantly to our understanding of the distribution in Ontario, and in many cases have led us to establish populations during our surveys. So the first interceptions in Canada actually date back to uh, 1993 from incoming cargo from elsewhere. Um, we had our first uh, confirmed homeowner finds in 2010 and 2011, and a first established population in those same locations in Hamilton, Ontario in 2012. There were also interceptions that date back to 2010 in, uh, in BC and in Quebec. The first surveys of BMSB uh, in Ontario were done in 2011 and 2012, primarily in corn and soybeans, although no BMSB were found at that time. Much of the survey work was supported by our industry partners and very, very much appreciated. Since 2013, we've continued to survey. And for our surveys, we've used a combination of scouting and trapping using commercial pheromone lures and traps, as well as modified uh, traps that have been built as a part of the research. We surveyed in agricultural crops, urban areas, transportation corridors, and natural settings. 
In 2016, we initiated a grower participatory project to facilitate the use of trots for early detection. And this research here has been led by Cynthia Scott Dupree, who's going to be talking about her work with insecticides in the next talk. I wanted to throw this slide up here about citizen science because so much of the information that we've received about the MSD distribution has come from interested citizens uh, looking up online to find out what that bug was they were finding in their house and contacting us. So we have an agriculture information contact center that people can send emails to or that can call if they think they've found a bug. I've received a lot of pictures and a lot of dead bugs in envelopes. Um, we've probably had over 2,000 since we started doing this. So again, it's been really helpful, and I, I encourage it for other jurisdictions. So this is kind of a static map for a pretty dynamic situation in Ontario. The map shows where it's been detected, either through survey work or homeowner finds, or both. Those are those areas in orange. Uh, detected means we found adults. Um, confirmed established, which are those red areas, means that we found breeding populations. So, um, CMSD, it's not really easy to find at low population densities. We think this pest is probably really established um, all the way from uh, Windsor to Ottawa, and we just really haven't found them yet. And I wanted to just throw this picture in here. So this is uh, an area here. This is Hamilton, Ontario. Toronto would be over here somewhere off the map. This is the Niagara Escarpment. And between the Niagara Escarpment and the lake, we have a very, very high density of um, wild hosts, of uh, structures that overwintering can occur in, and lots of tender fruit and grape production. Um, in fact, uh, most of our tender fruit production is in that region, um, as well as grapes. So this is an area at risk because BMSC is, is most certainly established in that area. So where did our BMSC come from, and how far will they spread, and why do we care? The genetics of uh, the BMSC found in Ontario is consistent with that found in the northeastern U.S. And the identification of an established population here, it really does correspond to when that population explosion occurred around the mid-Atlantic. So why do, we, why do we care about the genetic diversity of BMSD? Well, because it is, it is continuing to be introduced from its native range, hasn't stopped moving. It's possible that um, there can be hybridization of individuals from those genetically distinct populations in China and Japan, and that could lead to maybe increased fitness of our population, or maybe they be, may be better adapted to uh, new environments. The studies of the native range can also help us forecast where this pest might be able to establish in Canada and in other areas. And results of these studies show BMSC is not yet occupying all of the area, potentially could. So where is BMSC now? So this map, which unfortunately cuts off uh, part of Canada, does show the known distribution um, in Canada and, the, and, and in the U.S. As you can see, the areas in that mid-Atlantic area here where it's, where it's all red, um, that's the area where it first showed up and where the population pressure has been uh, is, is highest. However, it's, it has managed to spread all the way to uh, the West Coast, including Washington State. Several other provinces are actively monitoring for BMSC. Um, if you look at British Columbia, in 2015, they did have a few confirmed homeowner fines. And then last year in 2016, they found established populations both on uh, the coast and in the interior, not in crops, but they were homeowner fines and they were fines uh, in, uh, in wild uh, choke cherries. An established population has also been identified in the city of Montreal. So we expect that BMSC is going to continue to spread or be spread. I've really, really been lucky to be part of a brown marmorated stink bug IPM working group in the U.S. Um, a group of researchers from across that country and internationally participate to try to uh, look at research priorities and come up, for, come up with solutions for growers to managing um, this pest. So I've been, been lucky enough to go to several meetings and some of their folks, including Dr. Tracy Lesky with the USDA, has come up to some of uh, our meetings and spoken, and, and we've really benefited from that. In Canada, we also have a brown marmorated stink bug working group. Um, the Canadian Hort Council and Pest Management Center in Base of Alien Species uh, got <laughs> Pest Management Center got together to form an uh, invasive alien species coordinating group. So for both spotted wing Drosophila and brown marmorated stink bug, the idea was to bring together uh, people in in the country who were working on brown marmorated to try to take an inventory of our of our knowledge and and potential gaps uh, so that uh, future research could be directed in those directions. And again. 
really, really benefited from uh, these uh, relationships. So in order to develop management strategies, you really, really have to understand the beast. And so there has been a lot of work go uh, gone on uh, looking at the, the bio basic biology, how this infects overwinters, what it feeds on, how it develops, as well as looking at risk factors to crops and management tools, monitoring insecticides and other things as well as natural enemies and gaps. So I can't cover all of these topics in this, uh, in this webinar. And I'm, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on a few that I think are, are important points from a management standpoint. So the first of this deals with the fact that brown marmorated stink bug has a huge natural capacity for dispersal in addition to being uh, adapted for hitchhiker, hitchhiking. The adults are really awesome flyers, um, and they do that in pursuit of host plants as those plants are maturing and senescing. Some of them have the capacity to fly tens of kilometers in a single day, although most of them will easily fly over two or five. The nymphs are also capable of traversing some impressive distances in search of food. Um, they can easily walk 25 uh, meters in a day, which means they can move between uh, landscape um, plants and crops or between crops. And nymphs are interesting because they seem to have this underlying need to utilize multiple hosts through their development. That sort of crop, I'm gonna put an arrow here and hopefully you can all see it, this area here between the crops and the wooded areas, that interface provides a really assured food source for those nymphs because there's a, there's a diversity of food, foods in the wooded area um, so growing along the edge of that wooded area and then in the crops. So not surprisingly, a lot of injury to, to fruit, like tree fruit and other crops, is much, much higher on borders near woods versus the interior. And also BMSB is an arboreal species. It specializes in deciduous plants. So it's, it's able to find suitable resources in those wooded habitats, but it will definitely move in search of food when necessary, when those hosts that are feeding on are no longer uh, suitable. So usually it means moving into the border area. So that strong edge effect has been observed in multiple crops and in, in, in nurseries. One of the other things too is it, because it's this arboreal species, it tends to be more abundant in the tops of trees. And both that edge effect and that sort of top of tree um, bit of information is important from a scouting and management standpoint. So brown marmorated stink bug is a, it feeds on a lot of things, but it really is a fruit specialist. It, feeds primarily on the fruit bearing structures of crops and landscape plants. Um, the timing and the impact varies depending on when that fruiting period occurs. And again, remember that mixed diet, diet is really important for nymphal development. So that host suitability changes through the season. One of the things that, um, that we do see in vegetables, for example, peppers that have that indeterminate growth is that they have fruiting structures for extended periods. And so there really are often preferred uh, Feeding, for feeding and development of brown marmorated stink bug. And they really are summer, and after that, the, the nymphs tend to move on to other things. Grapes are another reproductive host of BMSB, and injury can be caused by both nymphs and adults. Movement into vineyards from adjacent hosts tend to occur when the crops are harvested around that time, perhaps late August or into October. And they can really damage those clusters and create wounds that promote sour rot. Small fruit like blueberries and caneberries are also attractive to BMSB when those berries begin to develop all through harvesting. And they can experience a, a damage all the way from discoloration or discolored fruit to premature ripening off flavors and fruit drops. One of the things that is of concern to Ontario is hazelnuts. This is a new industry for us here. And there's been some pretty heavy damage reported um, in the States and in Europe. And unfortunately with hazelnuts, they seem to be um, susceptible to damage through that entire hazelnut production cycle. It's really possible by understanding how BMSB under uses those hosts, we can develop landscapes that are perhaps less favorable to their population building up and maybe uh, reducing that risk to, uh, to crops themselves. So how can we use some of this information about BMSB being a fruit specialist for IPM? Well, more work has, has, has been done in orchard crops than in others in terms of trying to develop those strategies. We know that BMSB, the abundance is strongly influenced by the presence and maturity of fruits that are providing carbs and nutrients. Peach is considered a highly preferred and, and, and favorable and vulnerable host. Seems to be one of the few hosts that BMSB can complete its entire development on, so all the way from an egg to an adult without feeding on any other plant. So it's at risk all the way from shuck split to harvest. Apple, on the other hand, is not the, the, a great host for nymphal development, 
nymphs do have to feed on other things. So they will be moving back and forth between wild hosts and apples, likely for that diet mixing during the growing season. So management programs targeting BMSB and orchards next to woodlands might be very much perimeter driven. Um, and so, um, again, if you can target your management strategies to those border season, uh, border, borders and also recognize that in apples, they, most of the damage tends to occur later in the season, you can, act, you can reduce um, the, the amount of insecticide that you're, that you're using. And maybe use your most efficacious products um, late in the season when BMSC is most likely to be causing that injury. I wanted to throw in a slide to show that injury is not always terribly obvious. Um, you need to be looking at fruit, but you need to be looking at it externally as, and, and internally to see if there is damage. So here's some peaches that were hit and, and some apples hit late in the season. Um, that injury is very difficult to see from the outside, but when you cut open, when you peel it, you can see all of those little feeding probes um, underneath the skin. So make sure to look for, um, make sure to sample your fruit to look for injury. I'm developing, I'm devoting a single slide to this topic, monitoring tools in today's webinar. But really over the last several years, there's been a huge effort in developing those trapping systems for monitoring purposes and other. It's required the development and modification of traps and analysis of the aggregation pheromone of BMSB. It has not been an easy task. Um, as a result now, there are several different trap types and lures that are available com commercially. And I, I encourage people to use them as part of their monitoring for, for BMSB. Um, the pyramid trap, pyramid design, um, it seems to be one of the most effective designs um, overall. Um, and again, it is, uh, it is one of the commercial designs that's available. The, the lures that are used are a combination of aggregation pheromones of BMSB and a synergist, this MDT, which when they're combined are much, much more attractive to the nymphs and the adults of brown marmorated stink bugs. They tend to work better later in the season um, and uh, perhaps uh, not quite as well when numbers are, are very low and early in the season. So one of the things if we have these traps, um, we know with insect traps for other species, we can use that information to, to help guard our IPM. And the question is really, can we use these to uh, develop action thresholds for brown marmorated stink bugs? So a, a, a pheromone-based decision support tool was assessed using baited uh, pyramid traps in apples. So traps were placed in an orchard at border areas and in the interior. And what the, what the uh, researchers did was they developed five different um, thresholds that they used to actually initiate a spray in, on, on that block. They had an untreated block, uh, untreated blocks that received no insecticide. They had blocks that received insecticides uh, every, every week. And then they had um, blocks where they used a threshold of either one, 10, or 20 adults cumulatively in either of the traps to trigger a spray. And what they found was that using a threshold of 10 adults per trap, they, they had uh, equal control as those weekly sprays that were always treated. And they actually reduced their, the number of sprays by 40%. So I think we can say that it is possible to develop uh, thresholds for um, triggering insecticide sprays um, in, in orchard situations. So we know that this is, this is a possibility and I think that's really, really good news. Um, on, the, on the point of the lures and the traps that are used, um, every time you change your trap and your lure, your sort of trapping capacity differs. So the, th the threshold of 10 works for this lure and this trap combination. So there's more work to be done. We also need to know over what distance those lures are attractive, how many need to be put up in a block, where they need to be put. Um, and again, that whole point about uh, thresholds and trapping systems. And I threw this slide in here. This is some information that Tracy Lesky provided to us uh, a few months ago when she, uh, she gave a talk for us. But she was looking at different trap designs and different lures. And as you can see here, the pyramid trap are much more effective than the clear traps, and the Tracy lures outperform the ag bios at either low, medium, or high density of brown marmorated stink bugs. So again, that just that shows how important it is, and, and just re uh, reinforce that that 10 per trap is is a provisional threshold. 
So how do we, what are some other ways that we can make IPM work? So PEACH is, is really favored by BMSB. So its presence has been really disruptive to IPM programs where, where BMSB has been abundant. So some strategies, this um, IPM uh, PCR, which is um, crop perimeter restructuring, um, try to incorporate different strategies to manage three key paths in peaches. And one of those paths was brown marmorated stink bug. And essentially what they found was that they could do border sprays for brown marmorated stink bug versus whole block sprays at, at seven or 14 day intervals. And they found that the IPM CPR reduced the overall insecticide use and had similar or even lower injury than the grower standards. So that is really encouraging because it shows border sprays may be effective in some situations. And they also found that preliminary data showed the tactic was beneficial for conserving natural enemies. So that's another plus too, because the pesticides that tend to work against BMSB are not very selective, and there have been um, uh, increases in outbreaks of some secondary pests. Another approach to reducing insecticide use is to, to attract a bug to a spatially precise location and then retain it there long enough to eliminate it with an insecticide or some other agent. So there have been trials done with this um, attract and kill a strategy that does work for other insects as well. And what the researchers did was they, um, they baited some trap trees at the border of the orchard block. So these, these dark red circles here would have been these bait trees. And they're baited with uh, the fair stink bug. And what they did was they would uh, spray those areas and around those, those baits exclusively and compare that to an entire block spray. So instead of just spraying the entire block, they just sprayed those, those trap trees. And what the, I'm kind of simplifying things, but basically the answer seems to be that yes, that strategy could actually work. Part of the challenge is having um, a residue, um, an insecticide residue that works long enough to kill the bug that are attracted to the area. And many of the, the products we have now have a pretty short residual activity. But um, although the approach needs to be refined, it seems to have a lot of promise. Some of the other approaches that people have used are, um, are the use of trap crops, um, which is potentially really important for organic production. Um, there were uh, some trials using sunflower and sorghum around peppers to try to, try to divert brown marmorated stink bugs. These were actually pretty effective, mostly during the later fruiting period. Unfortunately, in this case, they didn't provide economically acceptable levels of control, but they did reduce BMSB. So again, it's a work in progress. Some of the other things that people have tried is they've used uh, nets that have been baited with insecticide, or they've tried barriers to try to keep brown marmorated stink bug out. So there's a list of provisional management strategies that has been put together. This is really general. And it, it applies to pretty well all of the different crops. Some of the crops have uh, more specific um, recommendations, um, but I don't really have time to cover all of those today. Uh, one of the most important things is, again, monitoring using those baited traps. Those traps are available, and they can be used for detection at low levels. We use them in our survey work, but they, they can be recommended to at least show when, if B and MSB is, is on your farm. Scouting is always important for any pest, and it's definitely important for BMSB. Remember that it's a landscape level pest. It'll move between hosts. So you need to be checking the wild host around the crops as well as in the crops. If you can look at the tops of the canopy, if you're working in an orchard situation, you have a better chance of finding them. They do tend to hide, and they do tend to be more active in the evening. So it is a bit of a challenge. You can use tapping trays for them or sweep nets if, uh, if you're uh, working in something like soybean. And you need to be doing that fruit sampling for injury so that you catch that injury early. It's a perimeter-driven pest, so you can uh, focus some of your scouting activities there. The populations do tend to be highest along those field margins. And border sprays may be su uh, sufficient. Use your insecticides only when necessary. And make sure to rotate your mode of action. Again, we don't have a lot of products here in Canada, um, but that is something that is being worked on. Um, one of the things when using insecticides is you are having an impact on natural enemies because most of them are, are again, they're quite broad spectrum. Um, so, you know, that is something that, uh, that needs to be considered. And thresholds are a possibility. Um, they are being developed for some crops using either traps or percent damage. Um, and remembering that the highest risk is usually during the fruiting period of the crop. 
those later maturing crops are also most susceptible to damage. So say is your sort of most effective product for that, that harvest period. I left biological control to last because many people feel that biocontrol is really the solution for BMSC. Remember, this pest came over to North America without its complement of, nat of natural enemies that would normally attack it and keep its numbers under control, just like the stink bugs we have here have lots of natural enemies. So um, what's happened is in North America, um, parasitism, um, so parasitism of the eggs in its native region is really important. There are some parasitic wasps that attack those eggs and keep the numbers low. And the, the parasitism of eggs by native parasitoids here is very, very low against BMSC. Um, even worse, it seems that BMSC eggs are almost a trap for our native parasitoids. So our native parasitoids love to lay their eggs inside brown marmorated stink bug egg masses, but unfortunately, they don't kill the BMSC, the BMSC hatch anyway, and the parasitoids fail to develop. So that is a concern. It's really what's happening is they're just not able to overcome that immune response. And it's possible over time, maybe a very long time, that our native parasitoids will adapt to, to BMSC. However, in its native range, BMSC numbers are influenced by these natural enemies. And one of the most effective is a small parasitoid that attacks the egg. This little wasp has been part of a screening trial um, in the States to try to determine how host specific it and other candidates are versus um, uh, other stink bug species. Because we wouldn't want to introduce something that, let's say, went after our, our, par our, um, our predatory stink bugs here. During surveys for native parasitoids um, that are attacking BMSC in the States, it was determined that this Trisulcus japonicus, some people call it the samurai wasp, was actually already present in the US and, and in fact on both coasts. So some of the genetic analyses show that these weren't actually, they were not the result of accidental escape from the quarantine facilities. Um, they, they were a unique introduction. And the populations on the east, on the east and the west coast um, are, are different, which suggests a multiple introductions of, of, that, um, of that little wasp. We haven't found this parasitoid in Ontario, but it's been found in New York. So it's really just a likely a matter of time before we find it here. And I just threw this up here just to say that um, because this insect now, this little wasp has been found in multiple locations in the States, um, there are uh, efforts underway to, um, I guess, mass produce it and release it to see um, if it will actually have an impact on brown marmorated stink bugs. There's a lot of really excellent resources on brown marmorated stink bug. And if you're looking for one location to go and get all of the basics that you need, visit stopbmsc.org. Um, it's a, a really excellent resource. There's information on uh, some tips for IPM. Um, there's lots of great pictures of damage to, so you can recognize it early, lookalikes. And they have an excellent video series now. I think there's about 20 different videos. They're all nice and short to tell you about the pest and how to manage it. So I like to send people there because I, I, I think there's a lot of good information and it's updated regularly. So in summary, BMSB is a highly polyphagous fruit specialist. Late maturing crops are often at a higher risk because there are peak populations of the late instar nymphs and the adults at that time. It's a landscape level pest with a strong dispersal capacity, um, both the adults and the nymphs, and it moves a lot between hosts. It doesn't spend very much time in any given place. It's a perimeter-driven pest, which is very, very important for monitoring and potentially for management. And the management tools that we have access to are insecticides, scouting, traps for monitoring or detection and thresholds, potentially biological controls, and then in the future, perhaps trap crops, attract and kill, exclusion barriers, or other. The range of this insect is still expanding. And so I encourage everybody to be on the lookout for it if you aren't already. That citizen science piece is very important. And for those areas where you don't know that you have BMSB, those homeowner fines, pay attention to them. Don't ignore them. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, that was very informative. Uh, just a, a quick reminder while we set up the next presentation. Uh, questions or comments, you can write them in the question tab on your control panel, and uh, we'll make sure they're answered at the end. And all webinar registrants 
uh, will receive a follow-up email tomorrow that will contain a link to a recording of the presentation today. So our second speaker is Dr. Cynthia Scott-Dupree, a professor and Bayer Crop Science Chair in Sustainable Pest Management in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Guelph. She received her doctorate from Simon Fraser University and has been with the University of Guelph since 1986. Cynthia is currently involved in surveying and developing IPM strategies for brown marmorated stink bug and ambrosia beetles in Ontario. Thank you, Cynthia, for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Uh, my presentation today, as you can see, poses a bit of a question on uh, are insecticides a reliable management option for this uh, invasive pest that we're dealing with? Um, Hannah provided a lot of really excellent uh, background information that I can build on for this, for this talk. And so in this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus just on a few BMSB impact uh, facts that may be valuable to know in terms of our discussion with uh, the use of insecticides to manage them. A little bit on BMSB response to the insecticides, just some general comments to keep in mind. Uh, an overview of some of the work that we've initiated at the University of Guelph to screen some of the insecticides uh, available to us in Canada and those novel ones that may be used in the future. Uh, a little look at some of the studies in Canada and the US. Uh, obviously, they've had this pest there longer, so they're way ahead of us in terms of, of the research that's being done. Uh, uh, so we'll look at some of their lab stuff, but the advantage for them in the U.S. is numbers of the insect uh, BMSB is high enough that they can actually be doing studies in the field. And at this point, we, as Hannah indicated, although we know where they are, uh, we still do not have high enough population levels that we can conduct a lot of the really valuable field studies that confirm what we find in the lab. So a little bit on some of the results and findings of their field studies in the U.S. associated with uh, insecticides. So some of the facts, first of all, as Hannah mentioned, this is an, an invasive species from Asia. But what's really interesting is that although we are gaining knowledge on the biological information on BS, BMSB, there's still a lot of data gaps, not only in the native range, but also in Canada and the US. And then until we can fill in a lot of those data gaps, we have we will have trouble developing the most efficient management tools that we can for them. But there's a lot of activity in this area, so it's a very optimistic research field, certainly in terms of filling in those data gaps. Uh, as Hannah mentioned, this is definitely a generalist feeder with a very extensive host plant range of 170 different hosts. Uh, not only does that include a lot of landscape hosts, but also unfortunately for the growers and, and our agricultural sector, a lot of cultivated crops. It causes this direct damage to harvestable fruit, as Hannah mentioned, and that makes it a pest of great concern. Uh, also because of its extensive host range. Another really important uh, characteristic to, to keep in the back of your mind is this continuous and unpredictable immigration uh, to crops and then back out into um, landscape, natural landscape areas. Uh, a lot of pests that we have will move into a crop and stay in that crop for the duration of its growing, the growing season. But this pest, it moves back and forth. And so that presents a problem when you're dealing with insecticides because you may apply an insecticide to the crop, but the insect may not actually be in the crop at that time. So then you have to start thinking about the residual activity of insecticides. And uh, that, of course, I will talk about a little bit because it is important. In the short term, we really need to discover some effective insecticides that we can use to deal with this particular insect pest 
because as as you can see from Hannah's presentation, there's a lot of potential uh, alternative management tactics to insecticides that we can use, uh, and hopefully those will be established and we'll be confident in their use so that they can be used in the long term and, and in the end we'll have a much more sustainable management program for this pest. So now let's move to some of the really interesting uh, responses BMSB has to insecticides. Now, of course, this first statement I have here, uh, the relative toxicity of an insecticide in the lab will be different from what's experienced in the field. Uh, I mean, that, that shouldn't be a great surprise to most people, but it certainly is very obvious uh, with BMSB. And I'm going to go over some of the results they found um, in the U.S. because it does it, it does show a difference um, in the reaction to uh, these particular insecticides in the lab and then taking the best from the lab into the field and finding that they don't work as well in the field. So that narrows the list of insecticides down substantially that may, we may be able to use in the long term. Again, this mobility of the of BMSB, and I've talked about that, and I've talked about why it's important to understand this movement and to take it into consideration, because those insects are not going to always be in the crop when you, when you treat that crop. They may be somewhere else. In some situations, we're getting a low initial knockdown in response to the uh, insects, so um, they're not always that efficacious. I'll talk about some of the uh, lethality indexes that have been developed in the U.S. and that are, are quite interesting. Um, something that, that is really of great concern is that following exposure to some insecticides, the BMSB seem to recover from a relatively moribund state. So they can appear almost dead, give them a little bit of time, and you get this recovery occurring. Now that doesn't happen with all insecticides, but it does with quite a few of them. So uh, it, it means that when we're developing uh, research on these insecticides that we have to consider that potential recovery so we can be confident in their efficacy. And then certainly a very, very interesting piece of information is that overwinter populations, and they overwinter in aggregations as adults, and Hannah mentioned that. So those overwinter populations are a lot easier to kill than the first and second generations in the US. Uh, remember in Canada, we at this point, we we truly can see that we only have one generation. We're still doing some more work on that, but it appears we only have one in, one generation. So as the season goes on, it seems like uh, these different generations become much less susceptible to exposure to the same insecticides. That is uh, quite problematic, especially when you have uh, potentially the worst damage occurring late in the season, for example, when apples are ready to be harvested and you've got your late gen later generations that seem to be more uh, resistant to some of these insecticides. So the study that we did at the University of Guelph, it's still ongoing. One of our biggest problems um, is maintaining cultures that are large enough and long enough standing that we can generate the individuals to do these, these research, uh, these studies, but we're, we're uh, moving through fairly rapidly now. This is a laboratory study and we're looking at direct contact toxicity. So foliar applications to individuals to see what effect these insecticides have on them. A lot of the work in the U.S. has been done in on adults. We're focusing on the fifth instar nymphs. They also cause substantial damage to, to crops, just as the adults do. Um, so we thought that there may be potential that the fifth instar uh, nymphs were more susceptible than adults. Um, this, is, this is something that's been seen in other insects, and then you would target that life stage over uh, the adults. We focused on 12 insecticides, either alone or in combination, and many of the insecticides that we're using are based on work uh, undertaken by Dr. Tracy Lesky that uh, Hannah mentioned, who works for the USDA, and they actually tested a very long list of 37 insecticides. They always have uh, access to uh, more control products than we do in, in Canada, unfortunately. Um, Tracy and her group 
uh, published this particular paper, 2012, in the Journal of Economic Entomology. I've given you the citation at the bottom of the slide so you can read at it, read it at your leisure if you need to fill in some of the details because I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Some of the most efficacious uh, products, uh, insecticides from that study, were thymethoxin, clothianidin, uh, malathion, lambda cyhalothrin, and chlorpyrifos. And the efficacy of these particular insecticides in Lasky's study were determined based on their initial efficacy. So first of all, on day zero, they looked at the extent of mortality caused to BMSB adults exposed to, very, to the certain concentration of these insecticides. And they classified them in three categories. First of all, a low initial efficacy if the mortality was uh, equal to or less than 10%, moderate, if mortality was between 10% and 90%, and high initial efficacy if the mortality was greater than or equal to 90%. And then a second to that, they compared the efficacy of those pesticides on day seven versus the initial efficacy. And so as a result of that, you can look at uh, the potential uh, impact of these insecticides on uh, BMSB. First of all, if you look at thymethoxin, clothianidin, malathion, and lambda cyhalothrin, their initial efficacies were all high. So that means that they were all call, causing more than 90% mortality. And when you do a comparison of the efficacies, uh, actually I'll add in chlorpyrifos there and speak to it because its initial efficacy was moderate, so somewhere between 10 and uh, 90%. But the interesting thing and, and what's valuable because we need to look at residual activity is that with the first three on the list, thymethoxin, clothion, and malathion, the efficacy remained stable, so at a high level throughout the seven days, where uh, lambda cyhalothrin, although it started out high, it decreased over that period of time, and chlorpyrifos started out moderate, and the efficacy seemed to increase over that period of time. So based on the performance of these in insecticides, we added them into the list of the total insecticides we were looking at at 12, and they are represented by the orange arrows down the left side. Uh, on top of this, we need to look at what's actually available or registered for use for BMSB control in Canada, and the list is quite small. It includes uh, thymethoxam or Actera 25WG, clothianidin, clutch 50 at WDG, and um, malathion. Also on that list is lanate toss and go, which we didn't actually test in this study. We had to limit uh, our list somehow based on our capabilities. Uh, the thing about uh, malathion is it was a conditional registration, I believe, and as of December 2016, it's no longer on the list. So although it was when we started the study, it's not there anymore, but I'm going to give you the results of what we did anyway. So for those of you who aren't aware of the kind of uh, relative toxicity exposure work we do in the lab, I, I'm going to describe it very, very briefly. Um, we looked at two concentrations of exposure, first the median and second two times the median recommended field rate. We were dealing with formulated product in this, is, in this uh, study, not active ingredients. So we were dealing with actual formulated products. We are exposing the insects using a mini spray tower, which is a one ninth scale version of, of, of the actual potter spray tower, which is quite large. Um, this allows us to spray certain amounts of uh, pesticide, certain concentrations onto the insecticides, giving a, a, a spray pattern that's realistic to what they'd be exposed to in the field. We anesthetized groups of five fifth instar uh, nymphs so that they wouldn't move around very much. And then we applied one mil of an insecticide solution and assessed their um, activity after 40, at 48 hours. In this particular slide in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the mini spray tower in our fume hood with Kaylin Hunter actually inserting a certain concentrate, a one mil concentration 
of a particular insecticide into the tower at the bottom of that silver tube would be a petri dish containing the five nymphs that you see up on the right hand corner these nymphs have been anesthetized and they're waiting for exposure and then following exposure we would place those five nymphs in a container as you can see in the bottom middle that has some food and water to keep them happy and, and then we look at them at 48 hours to see uh, what they're doing. So based on this, we have results for the median field rate. Um, on the right-hand side in that table, you can see the abbreviations for all the insecticides that we did test. Remember, malathion was applied at recommended field rate for BMS beyond apples in Ontario, not the median field rate. And of that very long list, we don't get anything that's very exciting, except for chlorpyrifos way over here on the right hand side, which provided about 68% uh, mortality. If we then look at two times the median field rate, again, nothing very exciting in, in our entire list. Um, boric acid, which we had tested as a potential uh, product that might be used in aggregations of insects in domestic dwellings. Um, we were unable to test that particular product at two times the median recommended rate because we just couldn't get that much into solution, so we didn't use that one. If we go over to the right-hand side of the graph, we'll see that our two best performers were chlorpyrifos providing 70% mortality and malathion at 78.5%. So nothing spectacular in terms of efficacy. I know we like to look at something that's 90% or greater. So uh, based on our results of the study so far, we find that uh, the fifth instar nymphs do not appear to be more susceptible than adults. We didn't test adults in this study, but we can look at what happened in the US. The median field rate, we're not finding anything spectacular in terms of the 12 insecticides or combinations we looked at. And the best we can do for efficacy is chlorpyrifos at 70 and malathion at 78.5, and malathion at present is no longer an option in Canada. We're also initiating or have initiated uh, residual toxicity studies so we can see um, how long some of these actually are efficacious. If we look at some of the field studies that have been done in the US, um, they're, they're really, really quite interesting results. Um, Teske did uh, work in uh, 11 and 12 um, that looked at some of the insecticides that showed potential in her laboratory studies. And she divided the season into three sections, early June and July, mid which was August and late which was September. And she's also looking at residual toxicity of three and seven days in this study. And what she did find in this work was that early in the season when insects were exposed to the insecticides they looked at, the mean, the maximum mean mortality was 60% mid-season it was 40 percent and late season it was 20 percent. So here's the variability um, uh, on efficacy of the in in insecticides as the BMSB moves through the season. So in late season we're actually dealing with the second generation, in mid-season we're dealing with the first generation, and in early season we're dealing with the overwintering population. So you can see the problem we are having already dealing with um, these kinds of uh, responses of BMSB to insecticide exposure. Again, the reason why we need to look at residual activity is because of this continuous movement of BMSB from wild host to cultivated crops throughout the entire season. And as I mentioned, when you spray your crop, BMSB may not be there. Um, so if they're moving back in, what, to, what is the residual activity? In these particular studies, uh, they found uh, so significantly lower BMSB mortality with insecticide residues of three days and seven days compared to day zero. Again, that's not really surprising, but what is interesting is that in 2012 of this study, mortality rates at seven days were higher than three days. And the specific reason for this is unknown, but this is the kind of stuff that occurs when we do field research. Um, we think we're on the right, uh, right pathway, and all of a sudden we get a result like this that makes it difficult for it to us to understand. 
one of the things that some of this research does suggest is that the use of a seven-day alternate rule middle application for BMSB in tree fruit may be better than the 14-day complete application. But the thing is, it, if we're recommending more applications over a shorter period of time, the question is, is this environmentally sustainable? Hannah mentioned the impact of these insecticides on natural enemies that may be existing in these agroecosystems. They are also important and we need to make sure we're not disrupting or causing some imbalance in the system that we can't uh, deal with later. It may end up being worse than it was before we started trying to initiate management. Some of the other work they uh, have done indicates there may be some antifeedant activity of some of the insecticides they're using. Um, they did a mid-season 2012 fruit injury trial uh, this is Lesky's group in the U.S. And the results suggest that apples may be protected from feeding injury for at least seven days after foliar, foliar application of fenpropithrin and dinitofuran. And so one, uh, fenpropithrin is a pyrethroid and dinitofuran is a neonic. So um, there may be some protection from these. But the interesting thing is that um, exposure to these insecticides didn't result in high mortality after 24 hours of exposure to a seven-day-old residue. What they were seeing is that there was some antifeedant effects. There wasn't a repellent effect or an avoidance behavior, but the BMSB just didn't seem to want to feed on the fruit. And so that is valuable information because that is something we want to stop. We want to stop that direct injury to the fruit. Um, another interesting study that was been done at the Hudson Valley Research Lab in Cornell, and they worked at, uh, looked at one of the objectives of their study was to look at the activity of sulfoxiflor as a BMSB antifeedant near apple harvest because um, this is when BMSB second generation and fifth instar nymphs uh, and adults are highly uh, prevalent and the apples are sitting there and they, they make use of them. So can we provide something that will keep them from feeding on these? The, although the study is really complicated and very, very interesting, um, the basic results out of this is that uh, at 24 hours post-application with a sulfoxiflor treatment, they're finding 71.4% undamaged fruit compared to an untreated control. And this continues to 48 hours after that post application. We're getting the same level of control, but starts dropping off at 72 hours. So interesting ways of using this kind of thing. Uh, Hannah talked about attract and kill. There's also another strategy called push-pull. So um, normally you deal with something that was more of a repellent, but if you can get the insects to stop feeding long enough and then pull them away from those in, uh, apples with uh, one of your uh, attractant pheromones, then that may be also an effective strategy that can be looked at too. So in conclusion, are insecticides a reliable management option for pests uh, for BMSB? Well, unfortunately, at this point in time in Canada, we really do not have any single silver bullet insecticide in terms of, of something that is highly lethal on exposure that causes high acute mortality to BMSB populations. Um, we really need to consider uh, the behavior or response of BMSB populations to insecticides over the season. We can see that uh, over the season, BMSB seems to uh, decrease its uh, sensitivity uh, and become somewhat more resilient uh, towards exposure to insecticides. That's problematic. This movement back and forth in and out of the field means we need to find an insecticide that also has some extended residual activity. And besides all that, we need to find something that's not going to have a non-target beneficial insect impact. So we need to kind of weave all of this information. Uh, we need to find the insecticides and test all of these other behavioral responses in terms of how BMSB bills, uh, deals with them in order to come up with something that's truly, really effective. 
and that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Cynthia. So uh, I know we're running short on time, but uh, now it's time for questions. A reminder, if you have a question or comment, you can post it in the question area on the control panel. And in, please include in the question, is this for Hannah or Cynthia or both of them? And I'll be reading off uh, the questions as they come in. I have one right now. Um, it is from Julia, and Julia asks, are uh, brown marmated stink bug vectors to pathogens, or are the wounds just more prone to getting infected after a feeding? Was that directed at me? It's Hannah. Yeah, I it can, was. I can take a stab at it. Yeah, that's it's a good question about the whole uh, vector piece, because of course, you know, insects do vector diseases. Um, I think that there is some work in the states that suggests that uh, for the most part no there is a, a polonia uh, which is broom that i believe they vector um but for the most part it's really that they're they're creating a wound that uh, diseases and or other insects might be uh, be able to take advantage of uh, more so than the vector piece um but i but the the answer is it, it's not i don't know that, that is what I've understood from looking at the, the literature. Uh, did you have anything to add, Cynthia? No, I haven't, I haven't seen anything that indicates they vector anything, but uh, the, the wounding certainly may predispose uh, to entry for other pathogens. Okay, uh, so uh, from Susanna, I have, uh, why the decreased sensitivity to insecticides over the season? question for me i guess um yeah, so. what, what i believe is that the the overwintering population of adults they 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 have lasted many many months so their vitality is much lower just because they are very they're really old and as the season increases there's just more resources for the insect insects to feed on and they just become healthier and more resilient they're also able to move more into other areas so they don't get the exposure that they might if they just stayed in the crop so all of those factors probably pay play into the fact that there's a decreasing sensitivity over the season Hannah, did okay. you have uh, from, yeah. from Janice, I have, uh, this is for Hannah. Are the edge effects um, more brown marmorated stink bug at the field perimeter? Are the edge effects equally strong in annual crops like tomatoes um, as it is in tree fruit? Yeah, it's a good question. From, from what I understood, the answer, the answer is yes, that there would be movement between both. Um, a lot of it, that movement, especially with nymphs, is because they're basically um, unable to uh, really be successful to get all the all of the nutrients they need from from feeding on one host. There are a few hosts that there are exceptions to that rule, um, but my understanding is that the edge effects are equally strong in uh, annuals versus uh, an orchard crop or a vineyard. Um, from Bob, I have uh, earlier fruit damage on uh, tree fruit appears similar in your, in your photos to hail damage, uh, indentation with a corky layer under the skin. How would we best differentiate the two types of injury? Yeah, so there's other things that, that uh, you, can, you can mistake for stink bug injury, um, as I'm finding out. Um, if the really the, the most definitive way to to find out if stink bugs have been feeding is to actually look at it under some level of magnification you will usually see a feeding point um, where the insect has actually inserted their their uh, mouth part um, it isn't always obvious um, but uh, but if you look carefully you will often see it having said that I've seen fruit coming in with uh, other conditions like um, uh, cork spot um, and it looks just like stink bug injury in some cases. So it's, uh, or sometimes you've got more than one thing going on on the fruit. So it, it can be a challenge, I, I must say. I'm still learning as well what, 
what that injury really looks like. So uh, another one for Hannah from uh, Jean-Philippe. Have light traps been used to attract brown marmated stink bug? And if so, how do they compare to pheromone traps? So we haven't used light traps for BMSB in Ontario. I think it would be fantastic if we did have a, a good network because there was some, uh, some work done in uh, New Jersey from I think the perhaps 2004 to 2011, they had a really fantastic data set of, of brown marmorated stink bugs. So I think they first detected it in their black light trapping system in 2004. And they were able to actually watch how that distribution and abundance changed over a seven or eight year period. So I think that black light traps are probably very, very effective from, for getting information, um, of course, they're, they're not selective, <laughs> um, but I think you'd get some very good information from them. I think the, the pheromone traps do work. Um, I don't actually know what their active space is. So, for example, are they effective from 20 meters away or 50 meters away? I mean, some pheromones for some insects work over really great distances, and I'm not sure that's really the case with, uh, with the brown marmorated stink bug. So I think, you know, if you're talking about a network and you've got access to blacklight trapping, it will probably give you some, some very good information as well. But I, I'm not saying the traps aren't useful. Um, I, I can't answer the relative efficacy. I can only say that I know that they're both useful tools. Okay, well, I have, I think Hugh was trying to ask a question. I didn't get all of it. It was for Cynthia. Um, so hopefully he, uh, he'll, he'll send us in uh, the rest of the question. Um, so while we wait uh, just for a little bit longer to see if any more questions come in, I just wanted to say a quick reminder, all uh, webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email tomorrow that will contain a link to a recording of today's presentation. So don't worry if you think you've missed something. Um, once again, I'd like to thank Hannah Fraser and Dr. Cynthia Scott Dupree for taking the time to share their hard work and expertise with us today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, BASF for sponsoring this webinar and helping provide this information to attendees. BASF would also like to extend their thanks to today's presenters and attendees for their participation. BASF focuses on the long-term well-being of every part of agriculture. For more than 100 years, the company has been working together with grower customers to develop innovative solutions for their farms. Uh, please visit agsolutions.ca slash horticulture to explore what BASF horticultural products have to offer for, you, offer for the 2017 season, and BASF will continue to introduce innovative solutions, including new insect management tools for the future. Okay, just checking here. Um, I, so I have a, a question for Cynthia. Is it possible brown marmorated stink bug is less sensitive to OP residues after zero to two days and thus pick up a toxic dose? Now, I'm I'm not sure about that. I haven't done enough testing on uh, OPs to do a comparison of that. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm really it's a good question. I'm just unable to answer it. Um, perhaps the person who's posing that question can get a hold of me, and we can have a, a more thorough discussion on on the uh, through email or on a phone call. Sure. I, I'm sure there'll be, uh, um, in the presentation tomorrow, there'll be some uh, links to, to get in contact with you, like it's through an email or something. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, yeah. So for Hannah, you mentioned that peaches host all stages of uh, BMSB. Are there any other hosts that are as favorable? Oh, probably. And I probably don't know all of them. Um, one of the things that um, some of those hosts that uh, are sort of landscape hosts, um, are seem to be good for season long, like Tree of Heaven, which, as I have found out, it was not a it's a it's a actually introduced species in itself that is now <laughs> seemingly all over southern Ontario. Um, from a cropping standpoint, I don't know about as good as, but certainly BMSB will lay eggs in things like grapes, and they will stay season long. Um, I think things like um, you'll see nymphs and adults feeding in tomatoes and peppers, so those are probably good hosts. Um, but I don't know that they're as good as, as peach. And 
since I haven't done that work. And I think the research probably has focused on a fairly limited number of hosts to do those studies. I don't think I can give you really a fulsome answer. Okay, I see um, that's all of our questions uh, for today. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone uh, for listening and have a wonderful afternoon. And for those of you in Southern Ontario, please stay dry.